In this video, I want to talk a little bit more about some troubleshooting techniques that I've learned over the years. And if you're in the service business, you probably already know about some of these, but for those of you that don't, these are a few tricks I've learned that can really make uh, troubleshooting go a lot easier. Now, one common thing I've seen here in my business is people will come in that want to buy a fuse for me. A lot of the do-it-yourselfers, they'll take off the back of the TV and they'll find a blown fuse and they'll go, aha, this is the reason the TV doesn't work. Can you sell me a fuse? And I'll say, sure, be glad to sell you a fuse, but chances are that's not going to fix it. Well, most of the time it doesn't. Once in a while they get lucky. There'll be a power surge that'll take out a fuse, but that's rare. Most of the time the reason a fuse goes bad is because something's wrong with the circuit, which, make, which is making it draw too much current. In other words, instead of, let's say, this uh, particular TV that had this power supply and it was supposed to draw only one amp of current, when a component short circuits inside of it, like this transistor, it may draw 5 amps of current. So, of course, if you have a 3 amp fuse, uh, and there it's going to blow. And that's what happens. So, what I'll do in an instance like this, is what, what I usually do, actually, the first thing I'll do is check a transistor that I suspect is shorted. And it'll check just like a straight across piece of wire. It no longer is a semiconductor, it's a full conductor. And I'll just go on the back side of it and check it with my diode checker. Uh, another technique you can use, and this can be helpful sometimes, um, I'll take a circuit breaker, like I've got here, and I'll clip across the terminals where the fuse would normally go. And this particular circuit breaker, it's designed for uh, three ampers. So rather than blowing another fuse, I'll try turning the, the unit on if I think everything's okay. And if it isn't, it'll trigger the circuit breaker. And all I have to do is reset it rather than replace a fuse. Now, another thing I like to do is I'll take and I'll hook the TV I'm working on, or the power supply. I'll, I'll hook it up to my Variac, which is a variable AC power supply. It goes from 0 to 130 volts. And the reason I find this so extremely useful is for two reasons. Number one, it's got an amp meter on it. The amp meter goes from 0 to 15 amps. So if I have a dead short in there, I may turn my power up to only maybe, let's say, 10, 20 volts. And I'll notice there's a problem right away. I may see my amp meter jumping all the way up to 4 amps when it's only supposed to jump up to, you know, a couple in some cases. And so this is extremely useful to me. I, I don't know how I'd make it without this little uh, Variac here. Uh, there's another technique that we used to use in another shop I worked in where my uh, boss would always have us put a light across the circuit. In other words, it would be the equivalent of what you see here. The TV set, instead of going straight into the plug, would have a light hooked in series with it. And if there was a short circuit in the TV that we just got done fixing, rather than blowing out brand new components, we'd know if there was a problem uh, just by the, how bright the light went on. For example, if the, if the light was full brightness and the TV didn't turn on, that would tell us if there's still a short circuit inside the TV and it's making the light absorb most of the power. So, oh, the other problem we ran into, though, doing this with some of the later model sets was that the... Uh, light bulb sometimes had to be up to a, a couple of hundred watts or maybe even higher with some of the modern day TVs. But again it would absorb some of the some of the shock if there was a short in the TV and that way we wouldn't ruin our brand new transistors because what had happened a lot of time you'd fix a problem in a TV and if you missed a component that was still bad you could end up hurting other components that you just got done replacing. Uh, another little technique um, probably aren't a whole lot of people in the TV repair business that are familiar with these inductive amp meters. These are more something that an electrician uses. But I find them extremely useful. In an, an inductive amp meter, it doesn't actually have to be hooked electrically to whatever you're checking. For example, if I wanted to hook it on this TV here, um, you can see how it's done. You simply open up the little jaws here and clamp it around one of the wires going into the television. And what it'll do is it'll actually show you how much current the TV's using. So if you know that this current's only supposed to use 2 amps, and your meter's up to uh, 3 amps, let's say, you know you you got a problem there. Um, another little trick I discovered is sometimes 
you're actually only supposed to clamp it around one of the wires going into the set. And of course you don't want to break the customer's cord, so you, all you have to do is plug this into an extension cord and then you can go you can take the split the extension cord down the middle so you can go around one of the wires. But another little trick I learned is to wrap the wire around this part of the inductive amp meter three times and what that'll do is it'll make it a lot more sensitive. So if I'm checking an amperage that let's say I can't verify on my um, on my AC amp meter because it's uh, too low of an amperage like maybe a quarter of, of uh, an amp or something like that this will actually make the meter more sensitive. It doesn't give you a true output but it gives you a general idea what's going on. And uh, oh, one more little tip here. A lot of guys that just started learning electronics that aren't, that aren't familiar with all the function on their digital voltometer aren't all that familiar with amp meters. Amp meters are different than your conventional volt ohm or resistance meter in that it has the equivalent of what I would call the short circuit across the two terminals going into it. If you look at the back of these amp meters, you'll see it's actually bridged between this terminal and this terminal with what they call a shunt. It's, it's just a thick metal plate. And this one has a smaller one here because it's a less sensitive amp meter, or more sensitive amp meter. In other words, this is 0 to 5 amps and this is uh, 0 to 60 amps. Now, that used to baffle me when I first started learning about, learning about electronics because I thought, well, how can this amp meter work if it's got a short circuit between this terminal and this terminal? And what I later understood about an amp meter is it's designed that way because it's not supposed to be hooked directly to a power source. It's supposed to go in series with whatever you're checking. And this metal, uh, this line here actually represents a shunt of the amp meter. And uh, it's kind of important to understand this because what will happen is if you go to check, if you go to use your amp meter, for example, let's say you use your, your meter and it's you've got your probes plugged into the amperage um, function, you, you have the equivalent of a short circuit between this probe and this probe. So if you're checking a particular circuit, you might blow something out. Anyway, I hope I didn't confuse you with my last explanation. Just a few more tips that I find helpful. So, anyway, uh, thanks again for listening.